The Ear to Asia podcast is made available on the Jakarta Post platform under agreement between the Jakarta Post and the University of Melbourne. Hello, I'm Peter Clark. This is Ear to Asia. So we have to take actions, and those actions would include recognizing that caste discrimination, caste exclusion occurs outside of countries like India, in a lot of countries, and making policies that explicitly prohibit discrimination based on caste. And these policies could be related to codes of conduct, to hiring, to social media, to supply chain management, and to advertisements. I'm sensing that there is some level of inability of the existing systems and policies to capture caste as a specific form of discrimination that affects a larger section of the community. So if the right cultural changes, the right policies and being aggressive about these changes, if these steps are not taken, then I don't see the issue disappearing. In this episode, Equipping managers to better handle caste discrimination in the workplace. Ear to Asia is the podcast from Asia Institute, the Asia Research Specialist at the University of Melbourne. As India's diaspora continues to expand in Western nations, what are the implications of caste identity and the discriminatory practices that accompany it for corporate managers? Caste is a system of social stratification that originated in ancient South Asian societies, determining an individual's social status and occupational roles based solely on the social group they're born into. It still influences social hierarchies today, particularly in India, and while prohibited by law there, cultural norms and social practices have allowed caste-based discrimination to persist, As more higher caste Indians have migrated and risen to leadership positions abroad, their over-representation has correlated with a sharp rise of caste discrimination in Western workplaces. So much so that some local jurisdictions in the United States, such as the city of Seattle, are enacting laws specifically banning discrimination based on caste. More recently, California produced similar legislation for a statewide ban although that bill was vetoed by Governor Gavin Newsom, who claimed existing anti-discrimination laws already suffice. So, what do managers and HR staff in Western workplaces need to know about caste and its often subtle or covert impact on employees' well-being and productivity? How does gender intersect with caste-motivated antisocial behaviours? And how can bosses best be equipped to play a role in preventing and addressing caste-based discrimination, and so foster a safe and inclusive work environment. Joining me to examine how caste discrimination impacts workplaces and what can be done about it are management and marketing researchers Professor Hari Bapuji and Dr Kanika Meshram of the Faculty of Business and Economics of the University of Melbourne. Welcome to Ear to Asia, Kanika, and welcome back, Hari. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Peter. Look, Hari, there are going to be many scenarios that we can conjure up today to try and give us some context for this quite complex topic. Just imagine, as we start this conversation and discussion, that I'm a HR manager in a fairly large corporation here in Australia. I'm non-Indian, but I have quite a few employees of Indian background and employees of all sorts of ethnic backgrounds within the corporation. And I've come to your office and I'm sitting down in front of your desk and I'm saying, Hari... I'm hearing about caste, and I'm hearing a little bit about caste discrimination. Please give me the introduction to caste and how I'm going to deal with it. So how would you describe, first of all, to me as an HR manager, a working definition or description of what caste actually is? Thanks, Peter. If a HR manager were to ask me what caste is, I would say caste is uh, a social hierarchy, a system in which individuals are placed entirely based on who their father was. And that gives them a status with associated entitlements and rights, privileges with respect to occupations they can practice, their social life, civil life, whom they can interact with, whom they cannot interact with, how they should interact with people. It determines a whole bunch of things with respect to a person's socioeconomic life. So this is the system, but 
a few things to be noted. One is that it is not specific only to India, but it is one that is prevalent in South Asia, outside of India, that is, in countries like Nepal, Pakistan and Afghanistan, where the caste may be known with different names, but they still share the same features of the caste system. So this is the kind of the background for what caste is. And of course, besides South Asia, where you, we see it very widely prevalent, it is also prevalent among the South Asian communities, which have gone to various countries around the world due to colonization and recently due to migration. Kanika, the caste system as we see it today in India has very deep roots, possibly 3,000 years old. So it's evolved and developed and obviously intermeshed and interacted with various social and cultural practices over that entire period. But to non-Indians, it's quite opaque, isn't it? Quite difficult to perceive caste and what those different levels of caste might mean. So to the non-Indian HR manager, what are the markers? How do people of different castes from India actually identify each other? Thank you, Peter. I think you've raised a very important and a relevant question as to how do you identify each other based on the caste. And to elaborate on this, caste system has given very clear caste markers, which HR managers need to be aware of. And I'm just going to throw a few. I'm sure Hari can add as we go along. One clear indication of your caste and where you sit in the caste hierarchy is your last name. And most people who have an upper caste last name is linked to something to do with spirituality or being of a priestly sort of a community. People from the lowest caste usually have names associated, last names associated with their occupation, be it cobblers or cleaners or tailors. And so these are very clear markers that identify you on your caste. Other than your last name, some more markers on caste are your dietary preferences. So upper caste people are mostly considered vegetarian, lower caste, and particularly the Dalits eat non-vegetarian food. There's also a system of social segregation. So the location where you were born, the place where you live is again a clear marker of your caste. In India, if you are from a Dalit background, you also have been issued a caste certificate. And this is a legal document that you can use to receive scholarships or to receive any sort of affirmative action policies that are there for the Dalit community. So these are clear indicators of caste markers. Kanika, just hearing about the names, that seems to be the most influential one. And obviously in my English background, some similar things apply, don't they? Like, my name's Clark. Well, that obviously comes from scribblers and clerks within offices. Yes, uh, indeed. <laughs> Carpenter is another obvious one within the English language. We've got dozens of those, haven't we? Even cobbler and all that sort of thing. So we can understand that. But are you telling me that virtually every Indian, when they hear a name, goes, click, I know what caste that person belongs to. Everybody knows. Yes. If I can rephrase that... You know, when you see a person, I'm sure our eyes can visibly differentiate the color of your skin, right? This is a white person and a brown person and a dark person. So caste markers are similar to that for an Indian. Just knowing your last name of a person. And this is where casual conversations amongst Indians will force you to reveal your last name, will automatically put you in the hierarchy. So that is a given. It is something that Indians are born with. It is such a part of the community, such a part of casual conversation that your last name is a clear giveaway of your identity. Peter, I'd like to jump in here. The names in some contexts or in some regions of India and in some regions of South Asia can be clear markers, but in some cases they are not. So it is a very fine kind of a dance that people make, like and they're trying to figure out the steps kind of a thing, right? And then they decide whether they're going to continue the dance or not. So if you imagine a dance floor, like you, know, you ask for what the name is, and if it doesn't reveal what the cast of the person is with the name, then they would either ask for the full name or their parents' full names, and then they move to their parents' occupations and then their dietary preference, where they come from, you know, the village, the location in village, a whole bunch of these things can be used to identify the caste location of a person. Once that is identified, so what we see is people not associating with them. People seeing 
those of the lower caste as incompetent, worthless, less than human in case of Dalits, that is. So you see the interactions shaping based on the caste position of the individual. That happens very automatically and very, very unconsciously. So in fact, it happens so automatically and so unconsciously that people don't know that it is happening. And people take it as very normal as part of everyday conversation. And in cases where they cannot figure out, often people would assume that the other person is from one of the higher castes because lower castes have been traditionally kept outside of formal roles and opportunities and resources. So they would expect that people from the lower castes are not part of their network. Now, Hari, as a non-Indian HR manager, wanting the very best within my corporation, within my company, I've heard you tell me that. And I'm thinking, oh... That sounds already sounds quite complicated and complex. Do I now need a book with all the names correlated with the different castes? Would you advise something like that? No, that's definitely not something that I would advise. Having a book with all the names and the castes is going to be extremely hard because there are thousands and thousands of names and many variations because people spell them differently. But what we can find out or what I would tell a HR manager is to be aware that this kind of thing exists and then find ways to deal with it when a complaint comes their way. So that's one thing that I would say. And then I would also say that they need to equip themselves to understand how caste operates as an invisible inequality in social life and in economic life. I want to drill more deeply into that. But Kanika, I'm just imagining how this actually operates within an Australian setting. So we've talked about the names. Are there things that an HR manager should now know about other aspects of what's happening within a particular department? Because corporations have their own hierarchies too. I'm imagining in my mind's eye now an intersection of hierarchies and status within a corporation. There's a management structure. Please try and describe for me now as an HR manager how the corporation, the company mission statement and guidelines for how everyone should operate together intersects with the caste system? That's a good question. I think it's important for the HR manager to look at the operating model of the caste system itself, because anything that is related to caste speaks of social inequality. So if you look at it from that perspective, it has to intersect with mission and vision statements of corporations, because I would be surprised if a corporation says they support inequality of any form. So recognizing that inequality model for an HR manager, it would be important to list caste as a protective category in their policy statements, creating some sort of vigilance about this issue, conducting frequent surveys and employee experiences and being loud about this. It is a system that has human rights crisis attached to it. So going and fostering insights from employees, recognizing caste exists amongst the community is probably the first way to go. It's a system of inequality. It will exist within a certain diaspora. And so what should we do in order to create vigilance, awareness amongst the non-Indian or people who are outside the caste sort of a conversation? I think that's a solid agenda that HR managers should pursue. It's also an important KPI to measure in recruitments, in hiring practices, in retention of talents, particularly from caste-affected communities. So these could be some standard practices um, that HR managers can follow in their process. I want to try another pragmatic approach now. I've got my team all organised. I've got a couple of new employees. Several of them are from an Indian background. And we're going away on a weekend away from the office on a team-building exercise Does that already raise red flags for you, Kanika? Are there going to be difficulties for me as an HR manager running some team building exercises which involve people doing role playing and being different people, imagining different scenarios amongst the employees? Do you see that as already a tricky situation? Indeed, because of the prejudice attached to people from the lower caste. So understanding a team is looking at a group of people being equal which is already disqualified in the caste system or in a hierarchical model of this form. And so though there are ways to 
resolve it by creating awareness and so on. I think tackling it at its source probably would be one way to build a team that is based on equality and inclusion and diversity. So, Harry, it seems to me that we are talking about a lot of intersections here. We've got colliding cultural forces really at work. We've got the overall Australian culture, which does have very strong ostensibly anyway, strong egalitarian impulses. We have the corporation itself, which is inevitably going to have a hierarchy and management within it. Then we have the caste system somehow intersecting with that or overlaying it at times. So am I describing that sufficiently to try and identify what are going to be some of the challenges involved for HR managers? Are we looking at that collision of cultures? Yes, I think um, we are looking at the collision of cultures for sure. But underlying all of this is the extent to which we value the other person irrespective of their position. In the Australian culture, for example, we see that no matter what the organizational position is, everyone is valued. There is a basic respect and common understanding of the human dignity that is valued and not compromised. Whereas in case of a caste system, that gets diluted. So that clashes with the values of the organization and the country are the broader universal values that we have in terms of respect for others and things like that. Can I say that so far we've probably been imagining the caste system as having an external force, if you like, on the individual within a corporation and confronting the HR manager with all sorts of management challenges. But what about at the individual level and about self-perception? I'm assuming, tell me if I'm wrong, that individual Indian employees within a certain caste see themselves within that caste and that must modulate and shape their behaviour as well. Is that correct? Yeah, that's quite right. We've been talking about it as a system, as something that is imposed as an external force. But what actually it is, is that it is an ideology. It is an ideology that keeps people in a particular position, gives them an identity, gives them relationships and a whole lot of things. So, in fact, in my work, I talk about how caste operates as an invisible inequality, as an identity and as a class or resources and as networks and as culture. Because it operates like this, it is very difficult for people outside to see it. And in fact, it is even difficult for people inside to see it. For example, people say, I'm a Brahmin, I'm a Dalit, I'm a Reddy. They say all of these things, but they don't realize that it is, in some ways, it is, it is perpetuating the caste system. It is, in some ways, making people become aware of the caste of the other person and then provide the basis for a lot of other activities that take place, whether it is the exclusion or inclusion or discrimination. So identity is one of the many ways in which caste system operates as an inequality without people knowing that it is operating. Kanika, the other collision that I'm summoning up in my mind now, and I'm sure Hari will want to talk about this too, talent. The idea of talent and merit within an organisation. You talked about KPIs a moment ago and just assessing people on how they perform. And of course, that does involve things like personality. But lurking within those behaviours and the personality, of course, the caste system is there within a person of Indian background. So what about merit and the meritocracy and the idea of talent? It's a very abstract word, talent, but we sort of understand what it means in practice. So is that another collision we're talking about here with the caste system and another challenge for the HR manager that there's a sense of fairness about people's talent and the merit of their performance and contribution to the overall output, if you like, or the productivity of the corporation? Absolutely. Um, If you look at the caste itself, it is a social currency. And probably the reason for its survival over these years being capitalist industrialization and globalization is because it gives you that social capital, that social currency that builds your meritocracy. And so people from a privileged caste, be it the upper caste, have always capitalized on that social currency. And so the very definition of meritocracy operates within that privilege that is given to you because your caste gives you access to good social network, good references. It gives you access to good education, good grades. You're not humiliated in schools by your teachers. 
that depth of currency and capital that you come with defines your identity, defines the confidence you have compared to a Dalit who probably would have none of these networks around their side, would probably have no role models in their cities, in their rural areas, and sort of feel humiliated and feel lessened throughout their life. So what I would suggest, and given that we're looking at it from an HR perspective, is a new way of looking at what meritocracy really entails. Does that include your access to Ivy League education and top social references and top referrals from your past employers? Or does meritocracy really include your past struggles? How did you make it to Australia for that matter? What was your identity back home? What was your background? You know, reversing the caste system, I would say, would be one way of looking at meritocracy. And this would probably be the most potent candidate for any corporation, given that they have survived these extremist social, cultural, economic situations to make it to a corporation. If I could jump in there, you make a very good point about merit and talent. And I like how you distinguish between the two. I agree with Kanika when she says that the idea of merit is very much rooted in the caste system. And world around, it is rooted in the class system with access to resources, with access to networks, with access to what is known as the culture that helps people to fit into the corporate culture, and with access to this self-confidence and identity as someone who is good and someone who is capable of achieving things. So that's the perception of merit. Whereas that is the perception of merit, talent is very different. Talent may be something that people can do. Talent may be there, but people may not perceive it. Talent may be coming up despite the struggles and that not being recognized because our perceptions of merit or our measures of merit do not capture it. So understanding that there is a difference between talent and what we see as merit, I think is a key to recognizing what companies are losing and what economies are losing with the ideas of meritocracy. And this is the latest you know, debate and research with respect to meritocracy is that meritocracy is essentially reproducing inequalities because it favors people with access to resources and power structures and things like that. I must ask you, Hari, it just occurred to me to ask, we're describing a system here in a very established system and a complex system. Are there individuals who buck against that system, who reject the caste system at an individual level and say, I don't recognize caste and I'm not going to recognize caste. Are there rebels within the system? There are definitely rebels within the system. Those who who say that they don't recognize caste and that they fight against the caste system. But the point with the caste system is that the minute you engage with it, you get a caste. Whether you recognize it or not, other people recognize it. So they treat you accordingly and they place you in the system and your relationships, your opportunities all of those are determined by that. So even if people want to rebel against it, the extent to which they can remain immune from it is very limited, particularly if you have interactions with others who are part of the caste system. If you are part of a group that does not have South Asians, then yes, you can say that I don't have a caste and it would be perfectly fine. You can interact with others as equal, but If there is one other South Asian person in that mix, then you know that caste has entered there. Kanika, let's talk another intersection. How does the caste system, at whatever level, how does that intersect with gender? And just reminding ourselves that, of course, the caste that you have is passed down from the father. So how are women different within the caste system? Particularly the lower caste women I describe them as a community that has been triple burdened. There's an intersectionality between gender bias, there's a caste element to it, there's an economic element to it, there's also the stigma attached to it. And so uh, given the hierarchy and the kind of conversation we are having, women probably take the largest burn of this caste identity and the caste war and caste prejudices because they are constantly also fighting through the cultural norms, the patriarchal norms. And so it becomes the hardest part. And a point I want to make here is the Dalit movement existed for the longest period. And so was the feminist movement in India. 
But these feminist scholars did not consider lived experience of Dalit women as separate to an upper caste feminist woman. And so that made it difficult for Dalit women to, uh, you know, they wanted to be part of the feminist movement, but also had to create their own experiences within the larger movement going around them. So talking to the HR manager, is that another layer of explanation that you should offer in the way of advice to HR manager and HR director? Absolutely. Ignoring this dimension probably would disqualify the conversation we are having because if you look at the caste system, it is an intersection of a variety of issues around here. You've got an economic layer attached to it. You've got the identity attached to your caste around it. You've got the location. Where are you from? Which part of the city or ruler area of India involved? So it is an intersectional issue and gender being the heart of it. So it definitely makes a case for HR managers to look at lower caste women or Dalit women, as we say, as the most vulnerable, the most protected category and look at their lived experiences when they go into the recruitment front. Hari, I'm imagining people will be thinking that the caste system expresses itself quite differently, say, in Australia or perhaps in another Anglosphere country like the United States, particularly I'm thinking of Silicon Valley and the, the tech industry where there are a lot, of, a lot of expatriate Indians within those and a lot of them are in the upper caste stratum. Does the caste system operate quite differently, express itself quite differently within the different jurisdictions in Australia, the United Kingdom, the United States? Do you see and perceive very big differences, the way it operates? Yeah, outside of South Asia, what we see is that caste operates differently. So in the Western societies, we pay a lot of attention or we uh, we emphasize the identity of individuals, their ethnic identity or uh, their ancestry. We see that as something that should be valued and recognized and appreciated. So here is where people use their caste identity to assert and in that sense express their caste and create conditions for caste-based exclusion to occur. Just to give an example, like the other day I was in Tarnet, one of the uh, neighborhoods in Melbourne, and I was walking in the car park and I saw so many uh, license plates of cars which have caste identities. Uh, Gil, Jadhav, a lot of these last names have caste association. And that's one way that people express. Incidentally, this kind of license plates which have caste names are not legal in the Indian context. So the other way they express this is in terms of networks. What we see in the Australian context, for example, we promote associations of individuals from different backgrounds. So as a result, we see a lot of associations, community associations that are based on caste. Just the other day, we saw one which said Gujarati Brahmin Samaj. So Samaj is collective or society. So the Gujarati Brahmin Samaj is obviously open only to Gujarati Brahmins. And similarly, we have uh, several Brahmin uh, associations here and there is a Rajput association. So we have this kind of associations which become the places where people network and get opportunities. And the third way this would happen would be in the context of Australia and other countries like that is like culture. So for example, the Gujarati Brahmin Samaj that I mentioned about was celebrating Diwali festival. So obviously the celebration of Diwali festival is sponsored by some companies. And these are the companies which are in some ways helping reproduce the caste system or helping the caste system to gain roots in the countries outside. It gets expressed as a culture. To sum it up, it gets expressed as an identity of an individual, as an ethnic or ancestral identity or as a heritage. And second, it gets expressed as a network, as a community. And third, it gets expressed as a culture in terms of celebrations. You're listening to Ear to Asia from Asia Institute at the University of Melbourne. And just a reminder to listeners about Asia Institute's online publication on Asia and its societies, politics and cultures. It's called the Melbourne Asia Review. It's free to read and it's open access at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. 
You'll find articles by some of our regular Ear to Asia guests and by many others. Plus, you can catch recent episodes of Ear to Asia at the Melbourne Asia Review website, which again you can find at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. I'm Peter Clark, and I'm joined by researchers of caste discrimination in the workplace, Dr. Kanika Meshram and Professor Hari Bapuji. Kanika, one of the most challenging aspects for an HR manager of their role is recruitment, actually getting really good people into the units and the various departments that they are responsible for. So here am I, an HR manager, and I need to recruit a deputy manager to go into an existing unit. It's a mixed unit. It has some employees of Indian background, but it has employees from all different sorts of background. Advise me now, because I've got quite a few applications from people, aspirants of Indian background. What are the things I must be aware of now? Give me some sense of a checklist, for example, of the things that I really should be aware of to make sure that that particular process, the recruitment process, serves the people involved, certainly, but also serves the corporation. I think one way to begin with this is I'm going to direct you to the Dalit discrimination checklist that already exists, which could be a starting point for HR managers to look at. These are 27 specific questions. They're very simple questions. They help HR managers to monitor, to identify caste-based discrimination and look at this issue from a equality and diversity and inclusion perspective. Now, Another way for an HR manager without going into the checklist and, you know, creating another tool kit for themselves is to clearly look at the resume of the candidate, which is a clear giveaway of certain markers. Uh, what sort of educational qualification this particular candidate had? What sort of privileged institutions they have studied in? Have they mentioned any scholarships given to them uh, based on their caste? Is a clear marker of it? What sort of referral checks they have got from privileged institutions? I think those sort of minor important details will help an HR manager to make a case, to get a clear sense of what this candidate is all about, what sort of privileges they have come through, and also can guide down the line on where do they sit in the hierarchy. I think these markers are not difficult. They're easy to locate. They're easy to understand and very clear, very objective-oriented. So I don't see an issue for managers to pursue in that direction. But what weight do you give it? I'm thinking of a very rigorous Australian corporation-style interview process where you have criteria, they're given certain weights. Are you suggesting, for example, that if someone from their resumes had a fairly easy ride coming from a higher caste compared to someone coming from a lower caste, that they should be weighted against or weighted for? How do you then weigh up all those elements that you've identified? Well, that's a tricky question because you also want to make sure that you're not discriminating an applicant in the process because that debunks the very conversation we are having today about caste-based discrimination. If I could jump in there. So there are two issues here. One is that um, ensuring that you know you get the right talent. And second, that you ensure that there is no discrimination. So what we see is that when we use our regular markers of merit, which is the Ivy League Institutes and, you know, very good English language skills and culture, great family background and, you know, the personality and profile and all of those things, which are the markers of merit. We are, in fact, discriminating against talent, which is the individuals who have reached the point without the benefit of all of this. So what we need to do is to underemphasize our value-less some of the markers of merit that we have and go for more objective ways of identifying talent. So that would be one. And second would be to make sure that when there is a screening, individuals are not disadvantaged because they do not come from a particular background. In the case of caste, it would be removing the caste markers. And from the name, like you could not list the last name, but at the same time, we also have to make sure that there are no other markers that indicate the cast of a candidate. And these markers could be, again, parents' names. In some cases, people give their parents' names or their background. 
are the kind of hobbies they have. Typically, people from the uh, privileged caste would have hobbies that we normally see as those of the dominant culture or those of the Indian or South Asian culture. So identifying those and giving less value to them and giving more value to the skill sets of the individual and identifying ways in which those skill sets can be assessed, I think that can make a huge difference in leveling the ground more than giving a benefit or privileging people who have had a rough ride and punishing people who had an easy ride. Kanika, would you expect typically to see within a corporation, within a department within that corporation, a correlation between the various caste levels and the hierarchy of the company itself? In other words, would the director of the department be typically from the Brahmin caste? And would there be problems in placing someone from a lower caste in a management role, in a higher status role, over someone of a higher caste? Um, this should not be an issue to have a lower caste person at a managerial role to begin with in an ideal world. But given that the conversation we are having is the identity of an individual is related to their caste, makes problems for the lower caste individual who is heading the position. Just to give you an example in this case, I speak to students on Melbourne Uni campus who are from Dalit backgrounds. And one of the comments the student casually made to me um, and felt discriminated, um, this is an engineering student, is really doing well, no names taken. The upper caste students told him that, oh, I was planning to visit the zoo in Melbourne, you know, now that I'm here as a foreign student, but now that I have met you as a Dalit, I don't need to see the zoo. I can just see the zoo here. And everyone laughed. And it was a very casual conversation. But you can unpack a lot of trauma in this sort of casual conversation. Is this identity created of students from the same background, same qualifications, but one is viewed differently, one is viewed uncultured in certain ways. So now you position this student as a CEO of a company managing people from the upper caste, what would that tension be between the upper caste employees who are at a lower position and a lower caste employee at a higher position? Will they respect his authority? Will they respect the managerial skills? I think this leads to a lot of trauma for the lower caste person in this case. Hari, let's delve a little more into just what forms that this discrimination takes. I was a little shocked hearing Kanika talk about that zoo jibe, that that would be considered in the average Australian workplace to be pretty rude and, and not acceptable. We have anti-discrimination laws too, and we have codes of conduct within businesses. So again, we're talking intersections, perhaps, or we're talking collisions, I think, and and one set of values rubbing up against another. So how is caste discrimination actually expressed within Australian corporations in your experience, in your analysis and research? So the kind of example that Kanika has given is quite stark and it would be recognized by someone from, let's say, Australia who is not South Asian origin and, and they would recognize it as, as offensive, even if those from uh, within South Asian context do not find it offensive. But it doesn't often be as explicit as this. It could be Something very minor in terms of uh, questions like, why are you eating meat? Or why are you eating meat on Tuesday? Or why are you eating meat during this period? This is supposed to be the festive season. So these are some of the kind of things which, when asked, they may not be recognized by those who are Australians. So what all of this really serve to do is to create groups and exclude some people and include others. So when you include people in your group as someone with some kind of privilege and position in an organization, those whom you include are the ones who get the opportunities and they are the ones who get picked for good assignments. They are the ones who get a referral and those whom you exclude are the ones who do not get this kind of opportunities. And because there are more and more of people from the higher castes who have migrated to Australia and other countries, what you would see is the inclusion of the higher castes are the organizations becoming more and more inclusive and more and more friendly to higher castes and more and more hostile and more and more exclusive of the people from the lower castes. 
Would you see it as counterproductive within a corporation to sit down with a mixed group of employees to talk about it? Is it talkable about? Talking about the code of conduct within that corporation, within that business, talking about the wider anti-discrimination laws, does it lend itself or would the Indians within that group trying to talk it out resist actually objectifying and talking about how it affects them, their relationships, productivity, uh, fairness within the workplace? Is it possible to talk about it openly with that employee group or is it far too complex for that? It is possible to talk about it, but it is not an easy thing. And here we can take examples from the experiences that we have had with conversations regarding gender, conversations regarding race, and conversations regarding indigeneity, which we continue to have. And these conversations did not occur because they were easy and comfortable conversations that people can have. And caste conversation is a little bit more complex, a little bit more difficult, mainly because it does not operate in visible forms. In the sense that if you walk into a room full of white people, for example, you can see that there is no racial diversity. And if you walk into a room full of only men, you can see that there is no gender diversity. But if you walk into a room full of, let's say, upper caste people, you can never tell that there are no lower caste people or people fall in, in the middle of the hierarchy. So as a result, it becomes even harder to talk. But that is what makes it also important that we talk about it because if we don't talk, then it continues to be reproduced. It continues to cause trauma to people and it continues to have effect on organizations and their performance. Because if an individual were to face a remark like what Kaneka has mentioned, obviously like that individual's day has gone for a toss. And that individual's day means the work that this person would do on that particular day is obviously not of the quality that it could be if he or she had a more positive affirmation from their colleagues. Yes, Kanika, these conversations must be difficult, but I'm interested in the how because I'm trying to assemble in our imaginations tools for the HR directors and the HR managers to actually not only identify caste, not only identify caste discrimination, but then move to that next level and that next step of actually dealing with it. And part of that must be assembling people and talking things out, as happens in football clubs and happens in corporations. It happens almost everywhere where teams work, that there are sometimes very difficult conversations. But would there be a great deal of resistance within those conversations from various cast members? Um, will this be a difficult conversation? It will be. But should this conversation happen? It should. Being a difficult conversation does not mean we should not talk on these issues. There won't be an overt resistance, I would say, but there would be subtle resistance. You know, you want to have these conversations such that there is a change within the organization, a change in culture, a change in inclusion and diversity. That should be the purpose of this conversation. So there are two ways you can address this. One is having a dialogue between multi-class and multicultural and multi-caste people, but also having those isolated conversations where people who feel discriminated based on their caste can go and report on these issues and speak of their lived experience on these issues, particularly the zoo example that I just shared, you sort of need a safe space for people to go and speak about these. And this should be documented in a way. Another form of discrimination you often get as a Dalit and particularly as a Dalit woman is if you see an Indian woman who comes across as very confident, speaks well, is eloquent, and then comes out saying, well, I belong to the Dalit community, the immediate reaction that she gets from colleagues is, oh, you don't look like one. So there you go. I've given you a clear marker that you're not escaping the caste system, whether you are meritorious, whether you have that talent you know, you are been put into a box squarely based on your caste identity. So having a safe space to talk on these issues is a must for HR managers. And also having that sort of a group conversation to break down these barriers, to unpack the crisis that it involves is another way to look at some of the facilities and conversations on this issue. Kanika, what ultimately for the HR manager would be the touchstone then, the code of contact within the business, the broader concept of anti-discrimination laws within the state and within the nation? 
other aspects, just cultural concepts of fairness and respect for each other, what are the touchstones for the HR manager finally? Because the HR manager has a responsibility to really, at the end of the day, be a little bit proscriptive and prescriptive. This sort of conversation is not a straightforward one. Or if you look at caste, it's not a straightforward, clearly recognized social evil. It is a very ingrained, deeply rooted, culturally rooted system that has amazing resilience. So to simplify it probably is not the answer. To make it more conversational, make it more open and at different levels, all the points that you mentioned, having a stronger anti-discriminatory laws, recognizing caste as a protected category in these policies, having a very clear guidelines in the mission and vision statements, and also generally an open culture in the organization where employees of different backgrounds feel comfortable to reveal their identity, to reveal their Dalit identity, to feel like that identity should not come in the way of how they operate in their work. Hari, up till now, I think we've been imagining the Australian company, haven't we? And I guess that's the most relevant thing to be focused upon. But of course, there would be differences between, say, an Indian multinational ensconced in Australia and running their company here, and then an Australian company or a Western company going to set up a company and a business in India. Do you perceive from your researches and analyses differences between those different scenarios? Yes, clearly. What we see is that in the context of an Indian multinational or one from South Asia coming to Australia or another Western country, the way it operates could be very different from the way it would operate in the case of a multinational operating in India, for example. In the case of a multinational going from Australia to India, you would see that the kind of talent pool that they have available, that gets limited to the higher caste and the kind of image that they get because of this talent pool and because of the networks that they have of what the Indian market is, what the Indian HR practices are, or what should be valued and all these kind of things are colored by it. So there is a strong influence of caste there that we see in the way companies operate in terms of, for example, having segregated dining spaces or having segregated kitchens and the kind of festivals they celebrate and these kind of things in the organizational culture. But also in terms of the networks that they create, so those would be the other issues. You can also see it in the supply chain where the lower caste individuals would be in the low value activities. Like if you take, for example, the textile industry, those who do the design and the manufacturers would be from the higher castes, whereas those who are cutting and sewing would be from the lower castes. So these are some ways in which you would see caste operates or caste affect the multinationals in the Indian context, where you would see a fairly strong effect. When you come to the Indian multinationals operating in the West, because of the institutional environment, you would see probably a little less effect of caste on their operation. To the extent that you can see caste, it would be through the company culture and through the company expats that are brought in. So these are some of the ways in which it is likely to happen rather than in the most common ways that you would see it in the context of India. Kanika, do you imagine the caste system as it's expressed here within businesses in Australia involving the diaspora, do you perceive that trajectory as gradually loosening, if you like, loosening the caste system over a period of time, the next 50 years or so, I'm imagining, just by that cultural process. I'll use the shorthand of the Australian fair go, and that does operate within our culture. We have certain, again, invisible boundaries where, you know, we don't tolerate people who get above themselves very easily within Australia. That's almost the opposite of the caste system, isn't it? Do you anticipate a trajectory over the next 50 years or so of a loosening of the caste system within businesses in Australia involving the Indian diaspora? The aim is to lose the caste discrimination and that sort of issues around it. But without adequate measures, I don't see that happening down the line. Because even if we have the Fair Works Act, we have all the fair policies within Australia, incidences like these do happen and have happened in Australian system. So I'm sensing that there is some level of limitations or some level of inability of the existing Australian systems and anti-discrimination policies to capture caste 
as a specific form of discrimination that affects a larger section of the community. So if the right cultural changes, the right policies, and being aggressive about these changes, if these steps are not taken, then I don't see the issue disappearing. Probably it will only aggravate and become more as we have more Indians and more global people visiting Australia. Hari, do you agree with that take from Kanika? I heard her use the word aggressive there. Does it need a little bit of push and shove as well? Yeah, um, I agree with Kanika when she says that. I mean, these are the kind of problems that do not go away just because people are in a different context. Because as you rightly mentioned right at the beginning, that we're probably talking about a 3,000-year-old system. And probably even longer than that, it's one of the most resilient systems, as Kanika has mentioned. So we are not going to see the end of this system just because it has gone to a different context. So we have to take actions. And those actions would include recognizing that caste discrimination, caste exclusion occurs outside of countries like India, and that it exists in a lot of countries. And making policies that explicitly prohibit discrimination based on caste. And these policies could be related to codes of conduct, policies related to hiring, policies related to social media, policies related to supply chain management, and policies related to advertisements. So we need to have policies that clearly prohibit discrimination and exclusion based on caste. And then we need to have develop training and resources to create this awareness of how caste operates in a very invisible fashion as culture, as class, as community, as identity, and then slowly create that awareness to have the conversations. And only after those resources are created and training is given, I think we can go to the third step, which would be the kind of conversations that, Peter, you were mentioning earlier, whether we can have a conversation with people of different castes. If we try to have without the earlier steps, they will not be ready because they don't see it as a problem. And more than that, they see a threat in it. Someone from a privileged background would see a threat because they see it as an attack on them. And someone from an underprivileged or an oppressed background would see it as a threat because then they are exposing themselves to further attacks and further discrimination. So we need to have a fairly comprehensive approach where we recognize it and make policies against it, develop resources to train people to recognize and act against it, and then make it part of the overall culture of the organization. So it's kind of a more comprehensive or overarching approach that we need to take. Hari, as we alluded to earlier, we have quite a significant cohort of Indian entrepreneurs and CEOs of that high-level leadership particularly in Silicon Valley and in the tech industry, but elsewhere as well. On whose shoulders should the responsibility for ameliorating caste discrimination within those various corporations, do you think? So irrespective of who is the leader of an organization, the responsibility obviously lies with the CEO or uh, or the leadership. But here is where the challenge also arises because they do not see it as a problem and they do not understand that this is something that needs to be addressed. So it becomes then a collective responsibility. And that's where I think people in the HR roles and people in corporate social responsibility roles, people in other roles which are senior have to take more responsibility to make sure that this is something that does not get addressed purely because the CEO does not recognize it. I think I would go above the CEO and look at the board of directors. And, you know, if you want to borrow some examples, we can look at sustainability or climate crisis. When board of directors feel passionate about this issue, they invest in companies that are highly sustainable, doing something for the environment. In similar fashion, when you educate the most top, particularly the board of directors, the investors in such companies about the crisis related to caste, they would also take active steps in addition to the CEOs, to invest in policies, to put up that pressure that we are really looking for in governing practices around this discrimination. I think in talking about the responsibility where an individual from a privileged caste is likely to be a leader, I think we also need to recognize that we don't want to demonize them or we don't want to right away assume that they are not ready 
I think we need to understand that there is an inherent inability or inadequacy because of the way caste operates, because they have not experienced. So I think we need to be more sympathetic to that aspect as well, rather than only talking about a divide in which you know one group is completely against the other. Because at the end of the day, we are talking about individuals who are rational, individuals who are well-educated and who are quite reflective and critical in their thinking. So I think we need to also keep that in mind when we talk about this, you know, the responsibility angle. Kanika, as a coda to our conversation, as we bring it to a close, our imaginary HR, which I've played the role of today, I think I've learned three things from our workshop. I need to be more conversant with the different caste systems. I need to be much more adept at identifying caste discrimination within the workplace that I'm responsible for. And then I have that really knotty challenge of dealing with that caste discrimination within my workplace. Could you leave me with something useful, a final bit of advice to help me on my way as an HR manager in dealing with caste and caste discrimination? Um, Linking back to Harry's initial conversation was to create a comprehensive culture where people would feel comfortable revealing their caste, revealing their identity and recognizing themselves based on talent and based on what they have achieved rather than their identity. I think that would be my clear goal for an HR manager to pursue is to let go of this discriminative practices through constructive and carefully crafted policies and culture and milestones around it is probably the best advice here. Hari, your final advice. So caste system, as we discussed, is um, it can appear complex because it is unfamiliar to us, but it also operates in ways that are very familiar in terms of name calling, in terms of bullying or harassment, or in terms of general exclusion and you know stereotypes and all of those things that we have seen in the case of gender and race and other such categories. So what I would advise a HR manager would be to bring out the toolkit that they have and then apply the same in a way that would also address caste-related discrimination and caste-related exclusion in organization. So we have made a lot of progress on issues related to gender and race in the last few decades. Like, and it's not a long history that we have, but we made a huge progress. And if we can apply that to caste, then there is a hope that the effect of caste can be reduced in workplaces. Hari Kanika, a truly fascinating conversation. Thank you for being with us on Ear to Asia and starting to unpack the complexity of the caste system within our workplaces here in Australia and elsewhere. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Our guests were Professor Hari Bapuji and Dr. Kanika Meshram from the University of Melbourne. Ear to Asia is brought to you by Asia Institute of the University of Melbourne, Australia. You can find more information about this and all our other episodes at the Asia Institute website. Be sure to keep up with every episode of Ear to Asia by following us on the Apple Podcast app, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Please rate and review us. It helps new listeners find the show. And put in a good word for us in your socials. This episode was recorded on the 26th of October, 2023. Producers were Kelvin Parham and Eric Van Bemmel of Profactual.com. Ear to Asia is licensed under Creative Commons, copyright 2023, the University of Melbourne. I'm Peter Clark. Thanks for your company.